great. So welcome everyone to the Harvey Milk Photo Center's artist talk for the first part of Our Mothers Ourselves. Um, my name is Melissa Kieser and I just want to um, introduce Ellen Konar and Adrian Defendi, the co-curators for this program, and I will have them take it along. Thank you, Melissa. Yeah, thank you. So I think what we're going to do is start with just a few little um, housekeeping things, and then we can move on to the question section. Um, we're hoping that if you have any questions, you'll put them in the uh, Q&A, and we can address them towards the end. Uh, to start off with, we're going to do a very short little introduction to the exhibit, a little bit of a walkthrough, and then um, and then the questions can start and we'll hear from our guest artists. Lovely. So I'm going to share my screen um, to get us going. <laughs> yeah, Adrian has the hard part here. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Hopefully I can, you're all seeing a beautiful, yes, I think you're all on. You yep. see our mothers ourselves, welcome. So this evening we have and are featuring uh, five artists uh, and you see their names listed there. You've seen them on the, on the beautiful uh, face, um, their faces already. Um, welcome. We're gonna walk you through um, the 3D virtual gallery, just so you can get a sense, especially for those people who uh, have not had a chance to get to the exhibit or perhaps will not be able to get to the exhibit. And we want to share this wonderful resource that was made uh, by one of our uh, artists, Steve Goldberg Band. Excuse me, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so I, we're just going to walk you through. And I think, Ellen, as we walk, we were going to kind of comment a little bit. So, uh... Yeah, as you enter um, on the right hand side here, there is a wall with one uh, image or one uh, piece of work by each of the of the artists. And we're going to talk about this. We're calling it a montage. Um, and so that's the introduction to the show. And then next alongside that wall is the work of Jerry, Jerry Takagawa, who's with us here today. Um, and it's these pieces are just marvelous in person. Mm -hmm. And right in front of us is Kathleen's work, who uh, who is also with us today. And and there is an audio component which you can actually zoom in on uh, home and an audio component which you can actually experience. Um, by the way, this was obviously taken the day of the opening, so the the bar had been set up. So. <laughs> it doesn't normally appear that way. I just want to forewarn those of you who are planning to come visit. And over here is the work of J.P. Terlizzi, who's also with us today. I just want to feature that. Yes. And he has not only just his, his, his wall photography, but an assemblage there that is quite amazing, which we hope to talk about. Um, and right in front of you is the work of Marsha Guggenheim. And um, that's actually me in that corner, <laughs> embarrassingly. <laughs> but we'll tell you about that as well. And then a little further along, a little bit of there we see Charlotte Neal's work. And next along the line is Adrian Defendi's <clears throat> one of a kind accordion book and a, a haiku with three images. And <laughs> there I am again. I clearly was was, was <laughs> <used> that. <laughs> <laughs> that's fun. <laughs> Photography and somehow didn't get eliminated. Um, so that's the work with my uh, collaborator and spouse Steve Goldband. And then right to the left here is the work by Leanne Milton, who is with us tonight, and we will be talking about her work. One up, a couple there. And last but certainly not least um, is an installation um, by Federica Armstrong. And it, there's a marvelous table setting and a, uh, a chandelier of sorts uh, with 
uh, cyanotype uh, photography. Lovely. So we will make this link available to you all. It's available in, in several places, but it's certainly for your guests or future guests that want to take a look at your artwork in, in place in the exhibit. Um, I'm going to exit and I'm going to um, share once again <laughs> and we'll get started. All right. So uh, this is the montage wall with, with the names next to those individuals who, who are present and with us. And so I'm gonna ask the first question. And my question to all of you um, is really, how did you come to these projects? Each one of you has an impressive project that is uh, about familial legacies, largely maternal, but, but <clears throat> sometimes also. Uh, the men are involved. We we don't always ignore them. Um, so I'm I'm curious how you came to do this project, which which is featured here. JP, maybe you want to start. I knew you were going to pick me first. I knew. It. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're over here on the left, and your name was. <laughs> yeah, inside. we may work across the the images. Yes. <laughs> yeah. For, so for me, I mean, a lot of my work is about my about my family. I, I come from a very large Italian family. So my project started um, when my a lot of my relatives on my mother's side of my family started to pass away. I had I lost nine relatives in four years. Oh, so wow. it was important for me to kind of like, you know, remember them and, and create a project around their memory, something that I could pass down to, you know, the future generations of, of, of my family. And that's, that's where it began. That's how um, the assemblage project started and also the descendants of which is in the show. Thanks. Leanne? Sorry for the delay. Um, so essentially it was, uh, during the summer of the pandemic, was it, no, was it this? Yeah, was it during the summer of the pandemic? Um, my son was like four months old, um, that I came across a box of old photographs um, of my mother's adolescent um, in, the, in their basement. And so I, I just started gently asking questions <laughs> to my mother about, about the pictures and, um, we would do uh, Zoom calls with her sister, my aunt, and my cousin to talk about like what it was like growing up and just to get a bit of their history. And it was the first time that my mother really talked about, uh, you know, what it was like for her growing up in Hong Kong and um, a little bit about their their my her mother's own history in terms of like uh, their family had fled war in southern China. So there was a lot of new discoveries. <clears throat> and is that picture one of the images that you were talking about? It's the picture shown here, the, the second one from the left. Um, that yes, yeah, no, and there were actually negatives. So I was scanning all sorts of really old negatives, some that had already cracked. So part of it was trying to preserve what was in the box mm -hmm. um, as an archive and then also just kind of sifting through and figuring out which, and this one's very kind of earth real to me. It's, it's, it's not, we think it's a family friend who made this picture mm -hmm. um, because it's very posed and she's, you know, she's turned a certain way. It's definitely not a snapshot. <laughs> so um, this, this person had some skills and um, yeah. So I was interested in this, in kind of this picture in terms of a memory. Right. Kathleen, that's an un, uh, an unusual image we're looking at at the bottom of. I, I think it's your feet. Yes, <laughs> it is. Um, it's unrelated to my other piece in the show, um, and I feel like this series is not as fully formed as my other one. Um, but this was just uh, it just started by looking at light. Um, <laughs> there was this beautiful light that used to come into my apartment and, you know, it was before I was um, working at my current job. So I had a lot of time to photograph. Um, so yeah, this piece I think is, it's still in the works. Um, so this is sort of the first uh, iteration of it uh, in this form. And the, the beginnings of the project about uh, uh, that is the, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So I can't pinpoint the exact time <laughs> uh, because I was already collecting um, flowers from when I went home. I was pressing flowers um, for years when I visited um, and my mother had given me uh, the image that's actually in the piece of her when we I was her age. So mm -hmm. <laughs> um, a lot of our family friends would tell me and her that we I look just like her um, mm -hmm. when she was my age. And that sort of got me thinking of, you know, the self portraits that I had taken. And I started, you know, um, mm -hmm. putting things together. So it was sort of uh, a lot of collecting. And then uh, start. Uh, I started assembling a lot of the things in 2016 um, to create this <clears throat> final piece. And Kathleen, your use of fabric, your your attention to the tactile nature of your work, which we'll see as we move forward, um, ties these together for me. Uh, mm -hmm. And when we were bringing these images together, we often thought how. Um, uh, as many of the artists here are, are looking at their legacies and their, and, their, and their maternal legacies specifically, that there was something about the feet that was rather empowering, as well as um, making an imprint. And of course, uh, our mothers have given us tremendous uh, uh, markings of all kinds. Um, so uh, we, we, we found this image particularly significant for this montage. Charlotte? Um yeah, Charlotte. I so, know. Yeah. So when the pandemic hit, um, <clears throat> I didn't think I could contribute anything that hadn't already been. I didn't think I could contribute anything that had already not been photographed as well. And so what I started to do is turn inwardly and started looking at um, vintage photographs that, that were personal as well as the ones I had collected. And in addition to that, my mom fell right before co uh, the shutdown in COVID and went into a facility where I really didn't have access to her for about six months or seven months. So I was going through the photographs and trying to piece together all these people that I saw and um, incidences and situations. And I realized I had very, I knew very little about my mom's past life. She never really talked a lot about it. And so it was, it really started to be a discovery for me, but it was problematic because since she was in such isolation and I couldn't really talk to her because she was, um, in, you know, couldn't get a hold. I mean, I couldn't reach out to her. I realized that her memory was fading and it would be even more problematic to understand what was going on. So that then stimulated all these narratives in my mind that what these situations were, what they could be. And so then I just started really to focus on memory in the past and um, then eventually combining uh, <clears throat> collage and fabric and thread, especially because my mother was a, a great seamstress and embroider. So now I have several projects related to my mom, many, probably too many, but... <laughs> Never too many. Never too many. But, yeah, so yeah, I, I'm working on several now. In fact, the two in the show are kind of tangentially related. Right. And Jerry, I know your project started long before COVID. So tell us about where that came from. Yeah, you know, there there must be something in the water or the zeitgeist that the stories seem similar. Um, you know, I think I, I've been actually working up to doing this project for about four years. And the uh, first, say, 32 years, I was mostly embracing the fact that I was Japanese um, and then learning uh, some kind of visual, you know, vocabulary to be able to express things. Um, and then, you know, I, I too found <laughs> box photographs of my parents and they were um, photographed in the concentration camps. And I'd never seen those photographs for all those years that I was, you know, with them. And it just, um, it just totally stunned me. It became something, something became very tangible to see them actually like photography made it real, I guess. And, uh, you know, it was, it was, I had the, I had the skills and the tools and the desire to actually 
become um, a voice because they were pretty much silent about the whole uh, the whole ordeal through World War II. They, they never really got a um, they never really explained much to me in detail. There were hints, um, mm -hmm. but anyway, it just it took it was a long buildup for me. <laughs> Um, Adrian, maybe you want to go to the next slide, which is Jerry sure. Wall and, um, <clears throat> and the, uh, uh, oh, no. You want me to, I'm sorry, could you cue me again, Ellen? <laughs> no, that's okay. I thought that, um, I, I thought Jerry's was next, but obviously it's not. There it is. Okay. There it is. There it is. Um, we'll move back and forth a little bit. Yeah, yeah we're going to have to do that, I think. Um, so uh, this is the series of Jerry's work. I, I want to maybe shift from not not the creation of the project, but um, a little bit about um, talk a little bit about um, our mothers themselves. That is um, something that you either have noted about your mother, or something that um, that she left behind that you have taken note of since maybe. Maybe in, uh, we could talk a little bit specifically about our mother's legacies. And Jerry, I know you have a, a particular image and a particular concept, so maybe you could kick off that conversation. Uh, well, you know, I in the uh, in the kind of preliminary questions you posed, uh, you mentioned the first image there, which is entitled Gaman, which is a Zen Buddhist term that means enduring the seemingly unbearable with patience and dignity. And it's, you know, generally like translated as perseverance or patience or tolerance. And, um, you know, that essentially was what I grew up with was a kind of a vague notion that there was something called camp and um, that it wasn't necessarily a real you know, real, it wasn't like a, a summer camp thing. It was, yeah. it was unpleasant, but <clears throat> we're not talking about it. And it, in a way, you know, it's, a, it's always been remarkable to me that that practice was, you know, just not giving it any energy and, and moving forward. And I think it served them because it helped them reintegrate. Uh, but it also served me because it made me. I, I wasn't. I wasn't prejudiced against the government because I didn't know what they really had done mm -hmm. until much later. And much later was when I found that box and I did some research and decided to become their voice because they had been silent for you know forty plus years of uh, having you know not not really expressing it. And I think. You know, I was trying to bring those feelings back um, and allow them to say something. Yeah, yeah it's really powerful. Mm -hmm. Does someone else want to jump in with what what comes to mind when they think of their mothers and that may have been core to their project? I'll just add something to that. Um, okay, there's like some interesting parallels um, just in terms of, I think, theme, themes with uh, Jerry's work and mine. Um, and I had also like researched and was thinking a lot about the power of silence. Oh. <laughs> it's okay. I'm sorry. Um, and then thinking about the power of silence and how silence can stop or in some ways, that power of silence, that silent itself doesn't really continue on sort of the traumas that they had endured. And so in some ways it's thinking about, at least in my project, I was thinking about what that silent meant, what, those, what the silence meant and why those stories weren't necessarily conveyed or talked about through like my grandmother to my mother or even, you know, her, uh, her other sisters. Um, you know, her, her lived, ex in terms of my grandmother's lived experiences, and then my mother's own lived experiences, and how she didn't convey those experiences to me. So it seems like it's obviously very painful in some of those lived experiences, and not wanting to 
talk about that brings up a lot of pain, but that silence in some ways, I think about how that may kind of prevent in some ways, maybe the trauma that they endured or um, so no, or perhaps like lessen the, the, the burden of even carrying those traumas forward. So kind of similar, I guess, in some ways, a little similar to what I, you know, what, what you know, Jerry was talking about and um, things that I was thinking about for my own work. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think that, you know, it, silence actually, I mean, it's been noted as a, um, you know, an excellent medium to transfer trauma. Yeah. Um, so, you know, parent to child, you don't really have to say anything. The kids seem to pick up what was going on. There was something going on. And I mean, even early in my, my um, you know, career as a photographer, I was doing social justice work without knowing why. Mm -hmm. I just was gravitating to it. And much later, you know, whatever, I, I discovered that, you know, it was probably something that was passed on from my parents and they didn't really intend to. Yeah. That is so ironic because I'm a photojournalist aside from this work. Right. <laughs> and so that sense of self, uh, social justice is very strong with me too. Yeah. So it's also really interesting because my mother always told me that she never remembered. And we could never figure that out because my <laughs> aunts had all these, you know, glorious stories to tell and everything like that. And I truly believed for a while I was um, my late um, boyfriend was a um, in um, uh, he did um, social work and he always asked me, he always wondered if my mother had been abused. And that's the reason why she she was traumatized. And the reason why she left Michigan without telling anybody to leave to go to California. Mm. Her mother was devastated, and but she one day picked up and left and left it all behind. So my mother would never, ever talk about anything like that. But I've always wondered. And when I mentioned it to one of my um, cousins, she had made a comment that it would not be um, something that would not have been um, out of the ordinary given the time. Yeah. I thought that was rather shocking. Yeah. Rather shocking. It, it is, it is interesting because in some ways it's not, it's not the, it's not consistent with our psychological theories today. You know, the, the belief is get it out, you know, let it go. You know, if you're, if you're not talking about it, you're, you're somehow keeping it inside of you. And, um, but if you think about the fact that that uh, if if you if it's in order to move forward and that's and and somehow compartmentalizing the past pain is allows you to do that it it it, it I'm not sure that it isn't quite healthy actually um, and it's just not in keeping with our psychological theories of the day. Um, but JP, you had a, a very different experience. Yeah. Um, so, so I, I want to hear your perspective on kind of uh, a, a little bit of the of your mother's legacy and and maybe the opposite of silence. I'm not sure. Yeah. So I did not have a, a strong relationship with my mom. I was estranged from with estranged from my mother for decades, for about two two decades. So most of my adult life, and it stemmed from. Um, my mother's trauma with her with her marriage to my father. They had a very painful and bitter divorce um, that was a long, drawn out, bitter divorce. And that kind of, you know, did a did my mother in it. it she could not um, forgive my father. She could not let it go. And she became this very, very bitter woman. And she ended up like lashing out at all of her brothers and sisters. Um, myself, my family. Um, so one by one, we all pulled away from my mom because mm. you, know, you had to make a choice. It's like this woman is driving us all nuts. And we all made the choice to like pull away. And so my mom was alienated from our entire family um, for about 20, 25 years. 
Um, and it's sad because, you know, I, I didn't have a relationship with my father. My father was non-existent in, in my life, but I was very close with my mother's side of the family, all my aunts and uncles, and they were very loving and they were very supportive and they were very loving and supportive of my mom when she went through uh, her divorce, you know, helping her out financially, being there for her emotionally and for her to act and behave the way she did and treated them so poorly and caused so much hurt and so much pain in my family. I, it was just hard for me to comprehend all that. Um, but I mean, she had her own, you know, she, my mom needed to see, my mom needed to speak to someone after, after her divorce, but she never did. And that, like I said, that just slowly ate away at her. So, you know, that's why I did this work. I mean, descendants, descendants is all about my mom's family. These are women who were, very, you know, very significant in my life that had a significant impact in my life. Um, and, you know, and it ranges from my great grandmother to my grandmother to my aunts, a lot of my aunts. Um, and then that's myself in the middle. And then the little assemblage that says transcendence, that's one of my oldest cousins who I am very, very close with. Um, so yeah, so these are all women that were very important in my, in my life and it helped shape the person that I've, that I've become. Uh, let's see, Kathleen, is, do you want to say anything about your mother and what, what you've taken from your relationship with, from her, with her? Well, it's interesting because I just sitting with this piece for a few years now, it, uh, it's more, it's, it feels like a celebration of our relationship. It feels more like, um, a way that I'm honoring her and the parts of her that I've, you know, discovered within myself as time has gone by, um, because she's been a she's actually on the listening to the to this oh, call right okay. now. So I hope, I don't say anything to embarrass her. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she she's a linguist and a writer, um, or and so a lot of my writing and my poetry is heavily influenced by her. Um, and actually, one of the the poems that I feature in this piece is a poem that she wrote for me when I was pretty young. That's that's Feathers. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I see her imprint. I like that word imprint that you use uh, in conjunction with my other piece because she has left um, a big imprint on my art practice and my writing and my poetry. So um, I guess wow. her legacy is just, it's interwoven yeah, uh, oh, in a lot of my oh, work. Oh, oh, <laughs> both physically and, and uh, 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 conceptually. That's, yeah. that's very, very cool. Um, uh, let's see. Um, well, the, you've sort of started down this path, and maybe we follow up with a with a question about uh, about your work does incorporate poetry, um, uh, photography, obviously <laughs> textiles, uh, uh, so many different mediums and and symbols. Maybe we could go back to that slide, and you could talk about it a little bit. Sure. Um, <laughs> I've sort of. I like to think of myself as just an artist who picks up skills along my career for what I actually want to accomplish conceptually. So um, I would say that textiles was one of the first art forms that I worked with. And that was way back in secondary school in the Caribbean. Um, we, we learned textiles then and to, to um, do stenciling on fabric, um, you know, sewing and working with fabric. Um, and uh, as an adult, I learned, you know, cyanotype and, um, you know, working more with uh, film and images in a different way. So um, I guess uh, at this point when I was making the piece, it was sort of um, a collection of a lot of the skills I had already developed. Um, and I saw, you know, the, I, I had envisioned the poem just kind of in gold cascading down um, when I was, you know, thinking about how the piece might come to fruition. And my mom had, uh, she she does cross stitch. 
and she spends hours and hours <laughs> working on these pieces and um you know the end piece is just so beautiful um but it's it's a lot of time and energy and i i liked the idea of using embroidery as a way to kind of um mimic that or you know as a as a parallel to that so uh, and yeah i think it's it, there are a lot of elements that are sort of uh repeated with, without my in within my all of my work so flowers are uh, a big symbol um i frequently use flowers from the caribbean in my work these ones that are pictured here are xoras um and the within this piece specifically, I was thinking back to a memory of um, going outside to collect flowers uh, that my mom had asked me to bring inside so we could put on the table. Um, so mm -hmm. there's a lot of memory um, also woven into this piece. So yeah, it, it's there are a lot of different things that sort of came together over the years and um, culminated here. Right. In fact, the many many of the artists that are with us today are using um, thread or stitching or embroidering. And um, Charlotte, I know um, you had mentioned in your intro. Uh, let's see mm -hmm. if I can get you there. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, how this came about, um, uh, and how you honored some of your mother's skills or artfulness. I think is how you said it. Yeah. Can you speak more about that and how. Um, how does it feel to be um, ritualistically doing what she did? So you're right. My mother was a very skillful embroiderer. She did beautiful, cruel embroidery. Mm. And um, when we were growing up, the period of time that, you know, I was an adolescent, you know, you learn to embroider. And I made a lot of pillowcases. Let me put it to you like that. Okay. And, and so as... I was thinking about, you know, how I could honor my mother and work on a project. Um, I took a class on um, printing on fabric and I just totally fell in love with it because I, I also collect textiles. So I, I, I've already got this passion for um, that type of artwork to begin with. And so when I, this particular piece, what happened is I was visiting my mom and she, my mother always visit, envisioned herself as being artistic and not really, you know, book learned as she said. So I asked her if she would color for me a um, coloring. And as she was doing it, she was getting a little frustrated saying, you know, I can't stay in the lines. I can't stay in the lines. And I said, the that's okay. Don't mm -hmm interstate with me for a while and I what it is I um share with her and reconnect with her through fabric and stitching mm -hmm. so what I did is I um printed you know silk organza over a silk organza image of my mother over the actual drawing that she did for me and then I embroidered over it with the idea of replicating that kind of chaos that was going through her mind because of her dementia. And my mother's also um, going blind because she has macular degeneration. So the idea of putting a veil over her eyes and also just a veil over the, the um, pigment print itself kind of reinforced that whole idea of what where she's at at this point in time. And a way once again for it because I can't verbally connect with her very well, but to do it through stitching and embroidering those things we used to do together is really cathartic for me. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So collaboration with Charlotte and her mother, with Kathleen and her mother, um, all the wonderful picture treasures that you, you all have found and have worked with. Um, JP, did you want to speak a little bit to your to your constructions because they're so intricate as well. I can the assemblage stuff, yeah. Get well, you before you get to the assemblage, if you could talk about the the red threads and the yep. and the blood yes. uh, images. Mm. So, so when I began this project, I didn't have I you know I didn't have any family photographs. My brother 
deliberately destroyed all our family photographs. And so when, you know, when several of my relatives died and I wanted to create this body of work, I wanted family photographs that I could have to call my own and something that I can pass down. So I, I came up with this idea of incorporating my blood specimens on microscopic slides. So it's a way of sharing our, you know, our shared DNA and a way of connecting my identity with their identity. And so I, you know, I stitched onto the, I stitched the, the, the microscopic slides onto the print. Uh, my grandmother was a seamstress and several of my aunts were a seamstress. My grandfather was a shoemaker. So the whole idea of, of, of sewing and thread was very much ingrained in my family. And that was the way, and I wanted to bring that out and incorporate the, the thread into the, into the body of work. And it's also a way of connecting identities. You know, it's, it, the thread is used for connectivity. Um, so yeah, so that was the idea and the, and the thought behind of incorporating my blood specimens and, and, and the thread. And this way, the, it, this, the, this portrait or this new family portrait takes on a whole another meaning. And when I pass away, you know, this is like this morbid souvenir of my blood that will be you know, passed down through other generations. Um, so yeah. So just to be clear, this is all your blood on each of these images. Yeah, this is all my blood. Yeah, right. I would. Wow. I would. We I were would, asked that question. I didn't know what the answer was. Yeah, I would prick my finger, or I would like cut my finger, and then I would have like you know on my desk here, I would have bunch of microscopic slides and then I would be like you know the blood droplets on the slide and, and so I'm not a cutter I'm not I'm definitely not a cutter but, um, <laughs> but yeah I would just like with an exacto knife I would like slip my finger or poke my finger and and draw the blood I at first I thought like you know when I was getting blood work done I asked the nurse I was like well can you give me a vial of my blood so I could take it home I'm working on this project and she like looked at me like I had you know 10 heads she's like I can't give you a vial of blood to take home I'm like well, why not it's my blood and she's like, you cannot take a vial of blood out. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, that's good to know. I won't try. Yeah, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. <laughs> um, Sherry, you're, you're you're all. I think all of the images in the show have uh, physical objects on them, in them, etc. Tell tell us a, a, about yeah. that and how you chose those objects i i the one i was thinking about was yeah it was gaman at the moment which has some wonderful things at the bottom of that one but but they yeah. all seem to have interesting talk a little bit about well these. you know i i up until this project i had done um the last two projects before that were more collaged like this oh. uh, but what i kind of wanted to do in this in this uh, series was to add some text based elements kind of you know as breadcrumbs uh giving people a little clue about the context or the meaning and um it you know so that sometimes they were based uh the objects were based on the documents that i put in the pictures sometimes a lot of times you know, I kind of revert back to my painting days and I'm actually painting with objects or just placing things because I think they belong there. So it's a very, you know, instinctive or intuitive way of choosing and placing. And, um, you know, again, it's just it, they, they are being created as if they were of you know finished paintings in my mind in in the gaman one on the first one i think there's some um there's some leaves that i had drawn made some rubber stamps of uh various things and i think some of them say gamans i can't remember now but there were some other words that i used that were japanese sayings um but it, it was different ways of bringing the text into the image and one of these is um, called A Jap is a Jap, um, which, you know, right. be horrible to say out loud, but obviously. Um, well, it was said. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, so tell us about that one. Uh, well, I mean, it was, it, that's a, that's a quote from, um, what was that general? And I can't think of his name right now. He was the, in charge of the Western command and, 
uh, he was basically trying to um, encourage President Roosevelt to sign the executive order that would allow him to clear the West Coast of all Japanese. And um, so he was, that was his statement to help encourage uh, Roosevelt to do that. Um, so, you know, it's a pretty strong statement and it's, it's quoted often, but, uh, you know, it's something that you just, you, know, you just can't believe that all this was going on. And, and for me, it was mostly when I was learning all of the, uh, the xenophobia and racism that was happening, I, I was just trying to imagine my parents who never really talked to me about it, um, how they must have felt while that was going on. So it was, it was, you know, a very powerful time for me. And it was hard for me to actually do this work because they were so silent about it that at one point I, I was afraid to show it because I didn't know if I was, it was a kind of betrayal in a way. Ah, so did you, did you have the opportunity to share it with them? I did not, no. I found the box of photographs that really moved me into doing this project after they had passed away. Got it. Got it. Well, I, Jerry, I have a question because you know I love your work, and and I think I may know the answer, but I'm going to ask you it anyway. <laughs> because your images are out of focus, and I'm wondering if that was deliberate. I don't think that's the way the images were originally. No, most they were actually printed uh, with a blur on them, so that they were softer. Um, photographically, it pushes them immediately to the background. And uh, the objects that I use uh, in addition on top are sharp. They, they are, you know, there's so there's a kind of instant uh, depth of field that's created. Yeah. And, and um, you know, and, and, you know, I mean, you can say that maybe the, the vintage photographs are, are, kind of memory and memory is soft and could be fading. Um, but, you know, like like JP, I mean, I, I in, in the beginning, I had included some family photos in other series before, and it was primarily to bring those ancestors back into my life in the present. Mm -hmm. And in this case, you know, it was it, it was a device that I kind of learned and I liked the fact that, you know, because and it was the, the other thing was that you can make an image quite out of focus, even if it was family. And if you just step back far enough, it was you knew who it was at a distance. And it was amazing how much you could resolve it um, yeah. without even trying. And. And I think then somebody told me for for the broader audience beyond my family that it allowed other people to see their own relatives in it, in a sense. Oh. So, so for me, what I what I got from it, what I in, in, um, gathered or from or my interpretation was, is that they the, it, the blurring made them not as human as they really were, right? Uh -huh. Okay so that they became less significant and that's what i every time when i look, used to look at your work that's what i used to think that's my takeaway everybody takes away their own pov right right right, right. and i yeah. So, yeah so it's just interesting to hear you know where the artist comes from but the beauty of art i think is <clears> the fact <throat> that you can walk away with so many different interpretations and that's what makes that's what makes the work powerful well thanks i i you know i in the end i mean it, it's, you know, it's a series about a pretty tragic and, and you know, kind of a unpleasant um, series of events that happened during World War II, but I'm pre representing it, I guess, uh, in a way that is kind of a both as aesthetic as I can make it and also as, you know, informative and and it, it allows you to kind of stay with the idea rather than being kind of pushed away from it. I, I think that's quite remarkable. The aesthetics of this draw you in. So, and then these real objects, you you immediately get drawn in by something that you, you know, that a lot of us may not want to deal with. So I, yeah. I, I think that's remarkably successful in that way. 
Um, I did have someone, uh, by the way, who 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 said, you know, in a series in which we're all trying to to uh, in which we're not trying, in which we are in some ways honoring um, our mothers and and our um, grandmothers, et cetera. Um, they said there was remarkably little joy in the photographs. And um, I, I have to tell you that that comment made me angry for a moment. Um, but um, so I, I, I'm gonna ask you all whether that what that's purposeful whether you would what whether you agree with that and then in your own work and whether that's purposeful whether that is is i want reactions to that hmm. i wonder if the joy uh, is in you know some kind of resolution um maybe for family mysteries that you know were were being resolved in the present um i mean in in a way you know it's kind of making something that seemed fragmented a little more whole and so satisfying if not joyous is yeah is, i it wasn't necessary i mean maybe it was you know there is a certain amount of joy of being able to say what they couldn't say you know, in a cathartic sort of way. I like that. I like that. I I I would say that that's that's a, a wonderful way to think about that. Any other reactions? I really I it was so so funny how I I I immediately had this kind of mm, but yeah <laughs> it was it was kind of that silent generation right so. Um, you know, it's it's kind of teasing out what went on in their lives, and you know, life is made up of joy, so sorrow, um, a lot of different experiences, right? And I think that if anything, I, I think we're all accustomed more in, into seeing that kind of, um, you know, the the this concept of the perfection of motherhood or being a mother and everything like that, when there's really a lot of pain and suffering that goes on in terms of, you know, living and bringing up children and being a mother, making certain choices and things like that, that I think um, is not a bad thing to share or point out. Yeah. yeah. Leanne, I know we have spoken to some of the artists about what they put on their photographs or stitch within. And I, um, we were very much struck by this series of five images, um, which are really, I don't know if Leanne is still on the line. Is Leanne, are you there? I'm, I'm, here, I'm here. Oh, good, good. Okay. I just didn't want to be speaking to you if you weren't there. Um, <laughs> we found, we found that this five uh, series of five images to be really, um, uh, photographically challenging in in a very in a very strong and effective manner, and we wondered when we when you look at these five images, what 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 legacy is left, or what is it? What would you like them to be communicating? What is your 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 first feeling there of of what is going on among the five images, whether technically speaking, emotionally speaking. Wow, that's such a deep question. <laughs> oh, um. <laughs> no, no, I know it's in there. <laughs> and, it, and, and we could hear from the rest of us if you'd like us to do a closer analysis. And, and <laughs> but I want to give you first dibs on on expressing that, and perhaps others would like. Um, okay. Um. Well, I guess initially for me, when the color came out as such, um. I think the coincidence was um, more about, I mean, I guess, you know, like in Chinese culture, like red is supposed to be a very, it's a positive color of celebration. Um, but in terms of red in Western culture, it's, it's, it can mean so many different things, anger, trauma, power, um, and so I was sort of dancing around with these like notions of what that color means. And then in, in addition to how it came out in terms of like the striping on the pictures and, and just sort of how it was 
uh, availing like my grandmother and because they're identification pictures, there's sort of like different expressions and some of them are quite haunting even in the original. And so when they came out printed this way, it was like, it was as if she was talking to me. It was, <laughs> I'd like to say it was intentional, but it was completely coincidental. Um, and so, you know, and I was also thinking about in terms of, you know, where my grandmother, you know, my grandmother was from China. Um, my, my mother was just a newborn before they fled the war. And, and I was, th you know, thinking about in terms of the kind of culture that she was raised in under Confucius philosophy. And also part of it, I think, is just a, a generational thing. So in terms of like, you know, gender roles and, you know, she, my grandmother was illiterate. And so she, but she was also a mother to seven children um, and had all of these very intense experiences growing up that then kind of shaped her as a woman or as a mother as she, as she were. Um, and then I, whether this is conveyed in the pictures or not, this is just me kind of thinking about like all of those lived experiences and then mm -hmm. um, just, I guess, uh, kind of how that would then be conveyed or passed down through the, the, matr the matrilene to my mother and then to myself. Mm -hmm. So um, that veiling I think was really important because I felt like my mother, my grandmother could never fully be the woman because of sort of the expectations of that era. Um, and so the restrictions too, I mean, she couldn't like really read or write and um, you know, necessarily she didn't work so there are, you know, other things of that era that I think um, kind of contribute to like, for, at least for me in terms of like how the red and the layers of color kind of all come together. Beautiful. I think the, the fact of collecting identification images, uh, which we all have and perhaps keep all of us, um, makes it very, uh, very specifically your grandmother, but it's also... Um, mirroring us all who's viewing these images uh so that that's so why i feel it really is both specific and universal in this kind of uh a passage of time um multiple expressions as you as you uh, noted and um find that that passage to be very interesting and compelling i'm thinking ellen uh there might be q and a's yeah. and i thought maybe we'd share <clears throat> and continue questions among the five artists um, to share the uh, the legacy notes. Sure, sure. So uh, if you can go to that, I'll just give a little introduction. When, when we thought about mounting this show, there was a, uh, an, an initial thought of maybe we would put out a call for artists and let, let artists submit their maternal legacies and we would decide maybe we would have a rolling show there was a lot of ideas and and what we ended up coming to was in is that we knew the word work would be evocative to allow for visitors to share with us their own maternal legacy and and we we offered up a typewriter and some paper and um, people kind of went to town actually during the opening reception and even since then and so um, we can share a few of those notes. Um, I don't know if you, if people can read this or if we need to read it, but I, um, I, 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 these are just little snippets of what what was left behind. Um, I, I personally love the one in in orange, but I I can't read it from here. So maybe if somebody else wants to, a million harsh no's made me who I am. Rebel, unmarried widow, writer, painter, all half-baked. Can't hold a candle to her magnificent, magnificence, excuse me, and yet I fly, stand so strong on her shoulders. Love you, Ma. It's just amazing. Um, 
Uh, uh, Melissa, I'm going to ask you one question about this, um, both uh, uh, in terms of the show itself and then the responses from visitors. Um, what made you want to do this show and, and what have you learned in, as, you know, at, 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 from a Harvey Milk or from a personal standpoint uh, on this show? I, I love the way it, it, you know, we started out when I met you and Adrian, we, we had kind of talked about doing a show around women and little by little it morphed into kind of focusing on, on motherhood. And I, I love how it ended up not being so 100% woman centric where we have, you know, male photographers participating in this um with the females and talking more about the legacy and how how we've grown from that and and it's it's been such a thoughtful show I mean I I don't know who hasn't come in and not thought about their mother's legacy and how it has affected what what we all do yeah yeah so I think it's it's super sweet and I loved reading these and you know, the one that says my mom and I had a complicated relationship. I just love that because who yeah. doesn't? Yeah. Yeah. That was a short and sweet one. I love that one. Totally. Yeah. There's some really sweet, sweet ones all out there. And it just, you know, it's it's a lovely exhibit. Um, I think it's just very thoughtful and cohesive in the work. The work remarkably um just completes one completes the other it's really interesting how it has morphed that gallery the way this you know we have a very in the Harvey Milk Center is a very unique little gallery space with you know walls and and um I don't know odd odd plugs and little places as you can see in the photos hmm. but um you know it's once this show went up it was so cohesive and so sweet there was just this the sweetness about it that just, you know, made it really work well in the space. Right, right. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at the Q&A and there's a couple of questions. I'm not sure if we've answered them already. We have, um, we have a question for Jerry to give us the definition of gaman. Um, uh, you wanna try that again, Jerry, just to- Sure. Um, it's a Japanese term of Zen Buddhist origin that basically means enduring the seemingly unbearable with patience and dignity. What a legacy. And you know, essentially what the practice did for the Japanese, which is a big deal, is that um, the whole being incarcerated was very shaming for the Japanese. And the, the idea of gaman actually kind of uh, it, it alleviates the shame. You can move on without shame. Yeah. And which is a big deal for that culture anyway. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And the question is sort of, it, it, you know, is that the legacy you want to leave to your, to the next generation? Or is it, is it time for a new approach to the unbearable? Are you talking to me? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, the next project I'm working on really actually wants to delve deeper into the idea of um, what that legacy of Gaman is to that next generation. So I've kind of started to reach out to um, Sansei, which is third generation Japanese artists that um, to, you know, kind of work with me to tell me how they feel about what that was like to grow up in that space. So uh, I, I'm, cause I'm, I'm trying to say, I think it's a, it, it has good things about it. I mean, you know, like you mentioned that, you know, it, maybe in today's, you know, psychology uh, milieu that it isn't really uh, the best thing to hold it in, but, you know, they, they seem to work, it seemed to work. It seemed like they were, happy enough and they were happy that I probably didn't, I wasn't contaminated by it. Um, I, you know, and also understand from my Jewish friends that it was very similar for the people, you know, that went through those camps and and didn't talk about it yeah. to, the, 
And so, you know, it, it's an interesting thing. I mean, it's, in a way, it's a kind of forgiveness in a general sense, I guess. Or at least the opposite of revenge, right? Where right, all right. It isn't, you're not you're trying to, to regain something that you feel you've lost or yeah, yeah. you have lost, whatever, yeah. It's, it's a very interesting, complex thing. And I, there's something in it, I think, that might, you know, do well to uh, for for our world right now, as it is the way you know things are going, that uh, some kind of you know, it's kind of like claiming chapter eleven in your emotions. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Okay, like okay, I can start over, and I'm okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I want to do it better this time, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, well, the, um, that brings me to one of the questions in the Q&A. Uh, Federica has asked, um, has the making of the project changed or affected your understanding or view of your mother and your family? Is there anyone that wants to, to take on that big question? Well, for me anyway, it, it, you know, there was, there's a, there's a whole lot of, strength in that in their being that I I maybe didn't know or recognize as well uh having understood what their you know their life was like at that time yeah yeah anyone else well, for I, me, I still relate to that by the way yeah go ahead for me it was more about learning you know acceptance and forgiveness and having being able to have closure with you know how my mother was, yeah. And so, are, does that mean you're you're not going to continue to do this work, or does that mean that? Oh no, I no, I I would like to do more on my on my family, you know. But um, yes, I'm doing the assemblage the assemblages as well, which is a little bit it's another departure from from the descendants. But. And we want to see more of those, but <laughs> I have to go to New York for that. But yeah, <laughs> right. Anyone else? Yeah, I would agree with Jerry. It's made me, I think, um, especially with my mom, you know, they say that with dementia, you either become a nicer person or, or a more difficult person. And my mother became a nicer person. And it made me realize that, you know, some of our issues that we had together were not just her, it was me. Now that I'm an older person and more mature, <laughs> not so focused on me. Um, <laughs> I can really appreciate, you know, more of what she went through, what what her background was like, and be a little bit more forgiving. And so now I'm trying to make up with that for that lost time. And so, but once again, the projects about her are very cathartic for me as I, you know, I reach out and try to connect more with her now, mm. that way, in that voice. Yeah. Kind of jumping off of that too, I think that self-awareness that you get or that I got, I guess, making this piece, it was it was more about learning about myself, it, um, more so than about my mother. It was learning about all those connections that I maybe hadn't thought about before. So um, it didn't necessarily change my perspective on my family, but it was definitely um, a discovery. Mm -hmm. And, and what's next on the path of discovery for you? Hmm. I'm not sure. I'm currently making some lumen prints. I'm not sure where that will take me, but um, those have been drawing me so far. So we'll see where that goes. Right. All right. Well, um, I think I can just, to say. Yeah, yes. I'll just close, close out this question. Right. <laughs> um, I so when I started this project, I, I mentioned that um, my I just had a baby, um, but I I sat with this work for a really long time because I didn't know how, I didn't know what to say with it, and um, a mentor told me she's like maybe you need to go through, you know, mothering for a little while for for it to start speaking to you, and. Um, and so I, it, it eventually started speaking to me, but <laughs> it just, it just took, a, it took a little while. I didn't know what to say with it um, until I guess I was then going through the process of 
being a mother myself and trying to, you know, I'm just thinking about all the things that, um, as, um, you know, relationships with your own mother and certain traits, how those traits are carried down from, you know, myself and then to my son. So I was really thinking about the matriline. Um, and yeah, eventually, I mean, I'm still working on it. So it's still, in, you know, I'm still kind of investigating and figuring out where it's going to go. I don't think it's going to end, but um, um, yeah. So I just wanted to yeah. share that bit. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we are past our hour, which uh, which was easy to do. I, I looked up at some point and realized we are already past the hour and we hadn't even gotten to, to the external questions. Um, there are a few more and maybe we can save them and, and uh, uh, respond in some other way. We do have this recorded so we can share the recording with you. We invite you to, to, um, to use the 3D uh, um, Matterport if you want to look at more of the work. Um, and uh, we also want to invite you to go see the show if you can. Um, and also that there will be a another artist talk with the other five artists on May 30th, but that will be at the Harvey Milk Center. So if any of you can join us um, for that, we'd love to have you. Thank you so much, artists, uh, for being here and, and attendees, and Melissa Kieser for all of your support um, on this show, this really exciting show that we were so happy to realize. Yes. Thank you Thank all. You. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. That's a great Bravo work. to your work. Wonderful work. That's Take yes, care. absolutely marvelous work. And thank you all for sharing. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.